society. So Mary, Mary Yap right here is the yeah. founder of Lithos Carbon, which is a company, I'll let her explain it, but it uses minerals to try to increase the carbon carrying capacity of the soil. Guy Hudson is the founder of a company called Loam Bio, which has a lot of big name investors, by the way. He lives in Australia. Um, Loam is using natural tools to also increase the amount of carbon that is sequestered in the soil. So maybe, Mary, you should start and tell us how you do it and what exactly lithos carbon is. Sure, thank you so much. Well, guys, it's so exciting to be here with you today. At Lithos Carbon, we seek to transform farmland into carbon capture centers. And we do this with uh, a natural process that we were inspired by called silicate weathering. So I think most of you guys don't know this, but 40 or 50 million years ago, when um, the, the, the continents of Asia and India rammed into each other and created the Himalayas, the global climate actually fell by two degrees. And that was because as the Himalayas came up, there was so much more silicate rock, a special kind of rock that forms the bedrock of our earth that was exposed and through a natural earth process um, where the CO2 in the atmosphere combines with this kind of rock, it captures a lot of carbon and permanently stores it. So we do an analog of that process at Lithos Carbon. We use an upcycled, crushed up volcanic rock dust. We give it to farmers where it actually transforms their cropland into carbon capture centers that captures this carbon for 10,000 years or longer. And at the same time, it improves crop yields up to 40%. So what we are trying to do here is create a circular economy, create something that improves crop yields, help field feeds the world, and also captures carbon and traps it out of the atmosphere so that we can tackle the climate crisis at the speed that the climate crisis demands. So this year, we're already on track to capture a couple thousand tons of carbon, even though we're very young. And both Guy and myself, um, we're working on trying to scale up a climate solution that can work this decade, not just in future decades. And what's the kind of stone you use? We use basalt. So if y'all have ever been to Hawaii or Iceland or watched Game of Thrones, that black volcanic rock, it's a, one of the most common volcanic rocks on Earth. And so it's used in cement or concrete or black roofing Tiles, that's all basalt. And when you do that, when they mine this material, you get all this waste dust that has no commercial value. So that's what we use, that's what we upcycle. Just to throw a couple more factoids in, basalt, when it's mixed with water, sequesters carbon, basically. Yep. And currently, farmers use what? Limestone. So right now, farmers use agricultural limestone. It's kind of that stuff that shells are made out of. What we do at Lithos is we actually use this black rock dust. We replace an existing expensive input that farmers use today, and it captures carbon. So when farmers use limestone, it's CaCO3. It releases 40% of its weight back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So we are both mitigating um, a natural input that farmers use that increases CO2, and we're also drawing down additional carbon dioxide. Right. So you're substituting something which you're giving them for free. Yep. Because one thing you should all know, both these companies basically are financed by carbon credits of some sort or another, which is a vastly growing market, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, Guy, uh, explain what Loan Bio does. Yeah, and thank you for having us here, and thank you also for the people who scheduled this program. Putting that session before was a kind of inspired choice because it gave you a wonderful context in terms of the importance of soil. We think about it in terms of microbial science. So at Loam, we work very hard to understand the microbiology of the soil and understand key microbial species that will help us not only to increase the amount of carbon that that, that soil is storing, but also increase the durability with which that carbon is stored in the soil. There was a couple of brilliant points made in the previous session around the importance of soil. But I think most of you would know by now that um, soil holds an enormous amount of carbon. It holds about 3,000 gigatons of carbon. So that is more than the atmosphere and every living plant four times over. What we need to understand is how we can work with those natural systems to accelerate a process that previously has been one where we've created degradation. When one of the other things that was mentioned in the previous session was around the, uh, the parallel to kind of uh, some of the technologies around things like direct air carbon capture and storage. And I find this an easy, uh, hopefully an easy way of you understanding what we do. So when you think of direct air carbon capture and storage, we have these giant fans on scaffolding sucking through atmosphere. We chemically scrub that atmosphere and we pump it underground to store it for the long term. 
Now, if you think about a wheat plant in a field as a fan that's stuck on its end, it's sucking in CO2, it's converting it to sugars through photosynthesis, and those sugars are being exuded into the soil. The microbiome breaks down that carbon and releases it back out into the atmosphere. So we have this respiration the whole time. That respiration globally is about 10 times the global anthropogenic emissions in total. So the breathing of the Earth is happening. We have these fans in place, but what we need to work out what to do is how we can scrub some of that carbon and ensure that it stays in the ground for the long term, where it can be useful for agriculture and useful for agricultural productivity. And that's exactly what we do at Loam. We work with microbiology to better understand how we can ensure that that carbon res remains in the soil for the long term. OK, but wait, how? Come on, you uh, say that. <laughs> we, we apply a seed treatment to agricultural crops. It requires little behavior change on behalf of the farmer, and they, as they plant that crop, these organisms grow in a mutually beneficial relationship with the crop. These are natural organisms. These are ones that are often a part of these systems, but have been uh, removed from the system through some kind of agricultural practices that we need to reintroduce them to support that growth. Okay, well, actually, this whole thing is more complicated than I wish it were, <laughs> because systems are complex, right? But just to say a few things Guy left out, he uses biomanufacturing to make a fungal solution that he treats the seeds with, and then the seeds, when they are grown, after they're treated that way, they have a lot more fungi, particularly in the roots, that then fixes the carbon. Did I get that roughly right? Nailed it, David. Okay, and the other interesting thing, it's interesting having the two of these here, they're very compatible. And in fact, a farmer could yeah. use both their systems at the same time because Guy is, is fixing carbon using a natural process in the plant's growth, whereas Mary is using the fact that agriculture is so vast as a way to scale an ability to get these minerals all over the world. And when she fixes carbon, she's fixing it for thousands of years, whereas Guy fixes carbon in such a way that if it stays in the soil, fine, but if you turn the soil over or so, you know, it might not be there forever, but it's still good that it's happening. So you have a shorter term natural process and a really long term physical process, both of which sequester carbon, which is what we need to do. Did I get that roughly yeah, right? Yeah, and I think something to, to point out is I think both of us take an approach where we think that when you look at agriculture, you can reimagine it as a global solution to climate change. Both of us entered this field, partially because we are geeks about plants. Like my family are farmers in the highlands of Taiwan, so I'm a geek about plants. But second, because of the inherent scalability of the issue. We all need to grow food, as the last panel said. We are, we're not robots yet, despite the robot upstairs, right? And as we think about scaling agriculture, which is about 25% of the world's emissions today, we need to do that in a more efficient manner, right? And so the fact that we can scale climate solutions in various ways through agriculture is really powerful. So we're taking a high-tech approach to agriculture, not doing less, but using the tools of today. Bioengineering, um, we use a lot of biogeochemical software and engineering to make agriculture more efficient and part of the climate solution. Now, I think the point Guy made before is really important, and Stefan in the previous session was more or less saying the same thing. You know, there's all this excitement it was just this last week about these carbon capture machines in Iceland that are finally actually capturing carbon and burying it in the ground. Okay, that's fine and good. Those machines are so freaking expensive, it's not even funny. And to scale them is going to be almost impossible, even though there's like 20 companies trying to do it. Meanwhile, you have this other way of sequestering carbon through agriculture, which we know works, which can be scaled and has the additional benefit of making the soil better at holding water and having a lot of climatic benefits that are intrinsic because it's all natural. So it, it's really amazing that soil has not gotten the attention it deserves. I mean, I, I totally agree. And it, to finish the point I was making earlier, if you think about those fans, we have an existing infrastructure. So for wheat, for example, we plant an average of a million wheat plants per hectare and there's 1.5 billion hectares of cropped land around the world. So we've got an existing infrastructure of many, many millions of these fans there that are sucking CO2 out of the air. And that gives us the capacity to be able to reach a scale of gigatons of removal in a matter of years rather than decades. And what that will do is give us the ability to be able 
to buy ourselves some time as we get all this other technology online. And don't get me wrong, I think that it's incredible the just spectrum of technology that is being developed today and the resources, both financial and intellectual, that are being put into solving this problem. But agriculture is one of the things that will be able to buy us time, that will be able to ensure that we have a fighting chance as these technologies scale and come online. Actually, that, let's pick up on that and then I want to ask you the same question. Explain what led you to do this. You were a climate activist before you started Lone Bio, but why did you do it this way? And, and what was your journey a little bit to get here? Yeah, so I, I've been working in the climate industry for about 15 years now across a really wide range of different sectors and energy and cities and transportation. Um, and I was always frustrated by the lack of scalability of some of the things I was doing and the speed at which we were doing them. I moved down to Australia, actually off the back of my wife's work, and I started looking into areas where I thought Australia could lead the world in terms of climate change. And over the course of uh, probably about a year, actually, I started looking more and more into agriculture and understanding agriculture. I found myself in a, in a dusty, drought-stricken New South Wales in a, a U, what you'd call probably a pickup truck, and I jumped in with this agronomist, and on the dashboard was a very dog-eared copy of the IPCC report. And we quickly realized that we were the only two people we knew who'd actually bothered to read that thing cover to cover. And as I spoke to this agronomist, and he started talking about research that he was doing around agriculture, but also into the role of microbiology, it was the first time I'd felt hope that we had a chance at being able to beat this problem. The scale, and we have a billion people working in agriculture around the world, the scale with which we can get to in a meaningful timing, a meaningful time frame to reduce, to remove a, a, a significant amount of carbon, there is nothing comparable at this stage. And there will nothing be... Nothing comparable to agriculture writ large, is that what you're saying? At this stage, like yeah. agriculture gives us in, this incredible existing workforce and existing infrastructure from which to address the climate crisis. Yeah, so... All these other things, including carbon capture machines, should go on and we should try everything. Absolutely. But if we want to buy time to allow the other stuff and, you know, get the fossil fuel infrastructure replaced by sustainable infrastructure, we can buy that time with agricultural interventions. I mean, how do you feel about that? And tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. Yeah, so my journey has been a little bit more winding. I come from a software background, so a little more similar to a lot of folks in this room. And the exciting thing for me about software was that it scales. Um, from the time I was 18 onwards, I was designing, coding products, finding your first user, your millionth user, and so on. Um, but I, in 2016, I decided climate change was the one problem I wanted to dedicate the rest of my life to. I went back to school, and then I dove straight into building climate models, uh, researching climate models and methane cycling and carbon cycling, but most of all, taking a data-driven, kind of like a software approach, a data-driven approach to how do we actually make a measurable impact on time skills that matter. And I ended up in the same place as Guy. I was like, wait, like direct air capture is so awesome. I love the machine, so cool. But the costs are like astronomical right now, right? And we need, we need to tackle climate change sooner. We're releasing f over 50 billion tons of carbon a year. And so today at Lithos Carbon, with this enhanced weathering process, we can capture one metric ton of carbon for one-fifth the cost of the direct air capture machines, which is great because we're very young company. Um, if we're able to scale to all croplands in the world, we can capture about 10 billion tons of carbon, which is pretty significant. And that's just croplands. We could also deploy in other arable lands. And so when I worked out the numbers, when I worked out the circular economy, called rock quarries and realized there was a wealth of this material on our hands, spoke to a lot of farmers and realized this is a problem they had. They wanted to regenerate their topsoil. They wanted to have cheaper inputs. Um, they wanted to you know, improve their crop yields and other methods that didn't just rely on synthetic fertilizer. I was like, wait, there's so many, you can kill like three birds with one stone. Help the farmers improve the crop yields. You can capture carbon, which is something we all need and needed yesterday, and also do this in a really measurable, permanent way. So yeah. scalability, same thing for me. Well, it's interesting, you're also building on this reality that this basalt is super available and super yep. cheap. Exactly. But, but did I get it right before when I said, even though, yeah, you come from a farming family and you're working in agriculture, Agriculture for you is a means to just yep. distribute this stuff on the widest possible surface area. That's true. And I think so a lot of people ask me, like, why not work in lawns? Why not work in forests? All of that is possible, but agriculture already has equipment to spread the limestone dust, right? And so tomorrow I can roll up to any soybean or wheat or corn farmer in America. They have equipment. They've done it every single year. They know how to do this. Well, you know, for a lawn so or a golf course. they just basalt dust instead of limestone. And that's exactly equipment. what they do. And yeah. it's great to see. 
Okay, I think you both should talk about the business model because we need to get into this issue of carbon credits, which does to some substantial degree enable you to be companies. So Guy, explain that. Yeah, absolutely. And when we look at agriculture, the, the agricultural industry and farming businesses want to do this, as Mary was just mentioning. These, what we need to do is to provide agriculture with the tools to be able to increase soil carbon. Farmers know how valuable that carbon is in their soil from a productivity and a resilience point of view. So when we provide our seed treatment to farmers, they, they apply it off the back of agronomic benefit they get in the season of application, so they get an additional yield benefit in that season, but then they also get the increased productivity and resilience benefits over time of building soil carbon. What we then do at Loam is help them to diversify revenues into natural capital markets, and in this context, in carbon markets. So we work with that farmer to baseline that property and to deeply understand the existing amount of soil carbon on the farm across the entire farm. We do that by taking soil cores. We take direct measurements. It's really important that we use robust and proven technologies to measure this carbon in a really accurate way. We then take that, um, we take that understanding of the land and we build, we implement these tools and we build carbon over time. We then take that to, the, to companies who are working towards net zero. We can sell it to governments to help them to support their targets. And we channel the vast majority of that money back to the farmers who have implemented these practices. So around 80% of the revenue that's generated from carbon credits goes straight back to those farms. And there's a really interesting inflection point when carbon stops being, uh, when our products stop being about increasing crop yield and carbon becomes a crop in itself. And then you get all of those decades of knowledge and experience of those farmers thinking about how they can maximize their carbon yield. Thinking about if they change this practice, if they do one less pass over the field, maybe they'll get an extra couple of percentage points in their, on their carbon yield. And that moves it towards a position of economic empowerment in this transition. That's I'm going to stop that. I was going to add something else, but I was looking oh, at the time as you're well. You're pretty good at explaining <laughs> it, but so are you, Mary. So what's your yeah. business model? It's similar. Yeah, it's similar as well. So we also sell carbon credits with a highly precise, empirically measured carbon um, that we create, this bicarbonate. So what we do is we sell these carbon credits to usually tech companies or digital companies on the coast. Part of our mission is to bring capital from the coast inland to rural farmers um, who really have razor thin margins. It's really, really hard to be a farmer. Um, and then we have a very special business model that seeks to reduce the barriers to entry for regenerative agriculture with our farmers. So what we do is we actually pay for the cost of all of this basalt, all the spreading, um, all of the transport to them. And so out of, the day, out of the gate on day zero, they are saving money from that limestone. In some of our farms, um, they spend $12 per ton of limestone. In some of our farms, they spend around $100 um, per ton of limestone. And when we replace that, that means from day zero, um, a thousand acre grower is already saving $100,000, which is pretty special for a grower with razor thin margins. And then on top of that, after we've measured the crop yield benefits, we've measured um, the carbon benefits and reported that to our carbon buyers, we give them a kickback of another $50 an acre um, per year, which is really exciting. So we're reducing barriers to entry, um, helping them tap into a really high quality carbon market and just trying to help their bottom line. If you do something that works for farmers, like they will adopt it. We don't even come to them with like, this is a climate solution. It's like, this is a solution. Talk a little bit more about the evolution of these carbon markets. Presumably, I mean, talk about where they are now, but what, are they gonna keep growing? Is this a given? Yeah. Either one of you, I mean. I mean, I think so. I, I've been in these carbon markets for some time now. I, I, uh, the first business I was building in this area is about 2006, 2007. So, this is something that we, I think we all understand now that mitigation will not be enough. We need to be removing gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere to give ourselves the opportunity to be able to address this challenge. And these markets are growing incredibly rapidly. Like uh, there's, I mean, there's McKinsey numbers of 15x increase by 2030. Of what uh, exactly? Carbon, mar carbon credit of, markets? Of carbon credit markets. Yeah. Um, there's a brilliant uh, researcher who works at Carbon Direct called Julio Friedman who talked about the need for a carbon markets industry the size of the oil and gas industry right. to hit our two degree targets. Yeah. We're talking about a trillion dollar market that we can work towards providing to farmers because of the crucial role that they can play in helping us to address this problem. Yeah. Don't you love the passion of these entrepreneurs? I mean, really. Um, Oh, what, we have two minutes left. What, what do you most worry about? What's, what are the forces 
that most jeopardize success for what you're each doing? Mary, start with you and then I wanna hear from Guy. Yeah, I think that candidly two ones. One of them is when folks say we only need to mitigate. And so I'll give a very quick anecdote. Um, I think of carbon removal as a mop and you can't mop up a flood. So I totally agree, we absolutely have to mitigate, but you're not gonna completely net zero agriculture. That's pretty hard. A lot of us took trains or planes to get here. We're probably not gonna absolutely stop that. And most importantly, developing countries have the right to industrialize, right? And so I agree, we have to mitigate as much as possible. It's much more expensive to remove that carbon after the fact when it's already up there and it's a very dilute stream. Um, but we also need a mop and carbon removal is that mop. So I think that's one thing, like we need to have a diverse range of solutions. The second thing is credibility in the market, right? Um, because the market is so big, because McKinsey makes these estimates, because we know that we're gonna need um, carbon solutions, there's also a lot of actors flooding the space, which is absolutely incredible. Like lots of innovation will come out of that, but at the same time creates questions about the quality of the carbon solutions that you're providing. And so I think that policymakers, people who are in the field, really need to push towards quality so that we know that we can have a long-term solution. Um, you need both scale and quality, or else uh, you, don't, you don't really tackle this massive moonshot that we need. Luckily, you're both very articulate, but add into that. Given that we've got 30 seconds left, and I completely agree with Mary, I was, I was about to say there's a real danger here in terms of the carbon markets that we create a race to the bottom in terms of price rather than the race to the top in terms of quality. We need to make sure that we're focused on <coughs> removals and we're focused on high quality removals. Uh, at Loam, we work a lot on how these organisms can help to support durability of that carbon in soil. Carbon in soil can be protected within that soil for decades, centuries, or even millennia. Making sure that we better understand the diversity of different types of soil carbon and how we can use and store them and measure them in a way that leads to long-term carbon removal is crucial to creating that race to the top in terms of quality for the market. And if we do that, this is an opportunity for all of us to have hope in terms of our ability to address this problem. Yeah, there's been a lot of really poor quality carbon credits and that has somewhat undermined confidence in these markets, but I think we can overcome that. We're out of time. I wanna just throw in my constant comment of we need radical cooperation. So I would like to see yeah. even the two of you cooperate, maybe work with all the other companies that are in the agricultural space to make that more of a cooperative movement we need you to be profitable, but we need to work together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.